Hi guys and welcome back to video three of this series of writing 2D games in Visual Studio using Coco Sharp. And in the last video we left our bat and ball game with just a bat or a paddle and no ball. So it's kind of pretty rubbish at the minute. And uh, we got a, a label but the label doesn't really do anything at the moment other than say zero. So what we're going to look at in this episode, this video, is really just about the ball, about physics, about movement, and particularly about the scheduling part of the game engine of Coco Sharp. Because when you talk about things like movement, you can kind of put something in place and make it move. But in order to be doing that continuously with a ball that's going to be bouncing off of the sides and hitting the bat and all kinds of things, then what you have to do is basically run code that's running fairly quickly, fairly frequently to recalculate those positions and all the rest of it. But the first thing that we're going to do, and as with all things, it's always best to try and do things a step at a time just to make sure that it's working. So let's add another sprite, CC sprite, and we're gonna call this ball sprite, just because we can. So just like the paddle, we're gonna do this. We're gonna load it, it's called ball.png. Again, just to remind you, this is all code that's stolen from the Xamarin sample bouncing game project. So if you wanna find that, Search for that on Xamarin and you'll find Bouncing Game. The code is there to download and see what's going on. Once we've created the ball sprite, we're then going to set some positions. So ball sprite dot position X. And again, these are kind of guesstimates really to start the ball somewhere fairly high up the screen. Dot position Y equals let's say i don't know 600 and then again don't forget to add child so that the layer draws it if we don't call add child effectively that just becomes uh, an orphaned item it will still be referenced by the layer because it's a member variable but it won't be drawn because the drawing code won't know to render it so once we've done that if we just kind of run that quickly then we should hopefully see a ball and a bat. Yep, so that paddle still works. Why isn't the ball moving? Well, we haven't told it what to do. All we've done is created it, positioned it and drawn it. So to all intents and purposes, that ball is nothing more than a little circle image that we've pasted on the screen. So how do we actually get the thing moving? Well, this is where this idea of scheduling comes in. So we're just going to have a method called um, run game logic because that's what it's called in the other code. And it has basically a frame time in seconds. And this basically gets called multiple times on a schedule. But that enables you to kind of keep track of where you are because it's not going to be called exactly at the same interval. But by using that number, we can tell how far, far we want to move or how much we want to update things. And this will get called quickly enough that it will probably work as a fairly decent approximation of what's happening in real life. And how we get this to run. Notice this isn't an override method. So what we have to do is we have to go schedule which is a mechanism to say call this method on the game loop and this is why the um why that pausing and unpausing in the app delegate uh was the app delegate was it here yeah why that's important because that will pause all of these schedule things so they're not using up cpu for for no reason so at the moment we've got that to call this it'll call this lots of times as the game's running but we, you know, we mustn't rely on it being called at a certain schedule. I believe you can actually set um, on some of some of the overloads of these. I think you can tell it. Come on, Visual Studio. For some reason, it takes a long time to find these methods in Visual Studio. Yeah, you can set the interval and stuff like that. But because we're trying to kind of uh, replicate a gravity and acceleration and stuff, we want this to be called pretty quickly. So we're not going to overly describe that and we kind of need to be keeping track of how fast our balls traveling 
in X and Y because we're going to need to use those speeds to actually work out what position we need the ball to, to move to. So we're just going to set a couple of kind of float values that we can use to keep that. What um, they've done an example is they've got a fixed value for gravity and in inverted commas. And effectively, it's just a magnification factor that's supposed to simulate how much acceleration we expect. <clears throat> so this is saying every second increase of velocity by 140 pixels per second. And they've obviously worked that out. You could change it. You could tweak it. Maybe you could have a game where that goes up um, a little bit for each level. So each level gets a bit harder. That's kind of up to you. Um, and we can kind of keep the score as well. So we might as well keep all of that there. And then what we're going to do here is initially we're just going to do something pretty straightforward. We're going to calculate the Y velocity. So the Y velocity is the one that's kind of relevant for um, gravity because we're going to go hit up and it'll kind of slow down, come down again. So we're going to take the time slice that we've been given and multi multiply it by the gravity to work out how much our velocity, our velocity should have changed. And obviously gravity slows things down, so that's a minus gravity. That's why that's there. And then we adjust the position. So position X, we're saying, well, in terms of left and right, it's the velocity is not going to change, but it's just going to um, move slightly. And um, the position is going to move slightly further, um, depending on how long you've been going for. Whereas with Y, the actual up and down bit it is going to slow down. So we've done that. That's all we've done at the minute is we've basically going to make it move because as we keep calling this, the positions are going to be updated because that time is going to go up and up and up and up. So let's see what happens if we run that. And hopefully what should happen is the ball will drop down. And it's gone. Bye bye. Now, obviously, there's lots of things missing from that code. Most importantly, actually, let's run that again quickly, including the fact of you know, even though in our heads we expect the bat to hit the ball, because we haven't told it to do that, we haven't put any code to actually make those two things collide, they're just two graphics moving over the same layer and they don't interact with each other at all. And one of the things about game physics, if you like, is there's lots of trial and error. Because actually, when you see how much code we end up with here to handle the ball and all the collisions and going off the screen and all the rest of it, you'll quickly see that it's so complicated that most of you wouldn't write that just, uh, you know, as your first attempt. You would do what I've done, which is kind of write a bit and go, right, what's the next thing? Well, the next thing's probably to see whether it's hitting the bat or not. So what we can do with some quite simple code is let's just put that on one line so as is not called paddle sprite it's called paddle so if you look here this bounding box transformed to parent now the reason that's important is if you've ever done any kind of 2d graphics before you'll know that within the actual area of i can't really see it here but let's say that's an icon within that icon that's going to be zero zero and that's going to be kind of, you know, 30, 30, that's going to be 60, 60, whatever. And then inside that icon, that's 0, 0, that's 30, 30, that's 60, 60. So how can I tell whether those things coincide? The only way I can do that is by transforming these coordinates to the coordinates, whoops, to the coordinates of the parent and doing the same for that and checking those coordinates. And then we can say, well, the coordinates of that with respect to the parent is maybe 50, comma 100 and maybe that's 150 comma 100 then i can tell whether those two things are in the same place unfortunately that method there or that property in fact will do that um, for us it will get the bounding box of the item but get it in parent coordinates and then another amazingly useful method here intersects rectangle so are the parent coordinates of the ball intersecting with the parent coordinates of the paddle. So that's a really easy way of basically saying, are these two things hitting? 
Now, what you've got to remember is we're not looking for an exact touch when the, the ball exactly touches the paddle. And the reason is very simply that depending on how quickly this gets called, the ball might have already gone past the paddle slightly before this code gets called. So we just say any time it intersects, then it's hit the paddle and we can deal with it. So we need to then kind of check a couple of things. So we could kind of say, well, is it moving downwards? And if it is, and it overlaps, so let's chuck that in there. Oh, and it moves the bracket for me. So if it's moving downwards and they do overlap, then we need to basically make the thing invert. Now, the reason that's important is because, think about this carefully. Imagine the code detects that the ball has hit the paddle, uh, but imagine that the, the uh, ball's already come past, let's say gravity is the paddle. If we've come past that, then we detect it overlaps and we invert the, the velocity to make it go up. But we might have only moved one or two pixels up before the code gets called again and says, oh, the ball still overlaps and it's going to reverse it again and it go downwards. So you can end up with the ball kind of getting a bit stuck. So again, not the kind of thing you'd always think about. And sometimes it might work on your test box and then you try it on a device and it doesn't work because the device is, runs a bit more slowly or whatever. So in this case, we want to make sure that we're definitely moving downwards. So it's a bit like a kind of debouncing thing to make sure we only do it once. And then what we're going to do is we are just going to reverse the ball Y velocity and then it's going to start going upwards again. Right, so let's see what happens now when we do this. So this isn't everything yet. Let's see what happens if we can make the ball hit the bat. Okay, so that's kind of pretty cool. It's now hitting the bat. Every time it hits the bat, the velocity is going to go back again. Now you can see the problem here is that it's not actually bouncing very high. And that's because the gravity has kind of reduced the velocity at a certain point, depending on when it actually hits the bat. It's never going to go fast enough to go higher than where it came to before. So there's a couple of different things we can do to, to solve that. But what we can do is um, we can kind of increase the uh, Y velocity a bit more. But instead, let's uh, velocity. Um, let's just ball x velocity. I'm just trying to read what they're they're doing here. So bring it bring it back in the the right kind of order. Um, oh, so one of the things that actually that you would have noticed there is the ball only bounces upwards. And one of the things you might have noticed about Arkanoid is that actually you want it to kind of move at different angles. And again, you can do it in a, in a couple of different ways. You could have it so that the, the quicker you move the bat, the more angle it adds, a bit like spin on a ping pong ball. Or you could just add a, a random amount. And what they've done here is they've kind of just added a random amount. So let's just do that to X and see what happens here. So hopefully what will happen with this is not only will it hit the bat but it also goes off the side oh and it's gone off the side of the screen surprise surprise so that's our next thing to solve is okay it's going off the side of the screen what are we going to do to stop that so i mean ultimately we're kind of asking the question should we Revert, reflect or reverse the x velocity in other words should we make it change direction left to right and what the logic is for that is again copied from the bouncy ball game is is the right hand position of the ball greater than the right hand side of the screen and is the ball actually moving in that direction because again the debounce problem you don't want it kind of hitting the screen and then kind of getting confused and then going off again. So we're going to make sure it's moving right and has gone off the right. Then we'll reverse it. And the same with the left. And if it has, then all we're going to do 
is reverse the velocity of it by multiplying it by minus one. Now, as you can see here, these things, it doesn't know what they are. So again, we need to get parent coordinates. So ball sprite bounding box transformed to parent. And then we've got the max X of it. So we got the effectively the right hand side of the rectangle. And then the min is the left hand side of the rectangle. So we actually want the outside of the ball to trigger this, not just the center of the ball. So that's pretty cool. And then we have to do the same for the screen. And we do that slightly differently. We got again, we have this, this member property of, um, of the layer, which is the visible bounds. So again, to get the max X and min X. Once we've got those, we've got the kind of reflection bits. So that's another section that we've done. And so now, hopefully, it's going to now bounce off the screen and boop. Okay, so you can see that we've kind of, kind of got the basics of what we're doing. And obviously if it drops through, we've kind of lost so at the minute our score isn't updating but that's pretty straightforward because all we're going to do here so remember this is the bit that detects the collision with the paddle and this is debounced code so this will only get called once per hit so all we do is increase the score and then our label which is called is just called label is that that's again a bit of a lazy way of doing it, it should really string dot format but never mind so now what will happen is every time we hit the score goes up how amazing is that now we've got to do a couple of things here if we're going to turn this into a kind of an arcanoid game for a start that ball's going pretty slowly so we're definitely going to need to speed that up a bit we're also going to need it to go higher up on the screen because if we're going to need to reach the top then that's going to happen the other thing is if that ball drops we need uh, well the score can probably stay the same but we need a way of it kind of resetting maybe losing a life and you know starting again and we could even get it to start with the ball on top of the paddle. So already there's lots of things that we can do to, to kind of tidy this up a bit. But if you look here, I mean, in some ways what we've done is pretty kind of straightforward. Is we've just added some very basic positioning stuff using the frame time as a way of approximating the acceleration in Y. So by using that gravity, if we actually reduce that gravity and make it, say, 100, oh, to stop the debugger first and do this, I think we'll find that it will um, the ball will float up higher. Hopefully it will anyway. Although I probably need to drop drop the ball from higher up as well. So it takes takes a bit longer to slow down and a bit longer to speed up. So actually, we probably need that to be a bit more like that and probably start that up maybe more like there. Obviously, we can do various things to increase the velocity of the ball. Uh, at the minute, effectively, it's using its kind of starting position. And so it will never go higher than its starting position. But actually, if we kind of end up increasing that a bit, or if we start with the ball on the paddle, and then we set its kind of speed accordingly to make sure it goes all the way to the top of the screen, then we'll be able to resolve that. But um, I think actually, before I get onto the next video, I think probably most of you guys can have a go. See if you can make the game reset if the ball drops off the bottom. So you've got a couple of ways of doing that. If you just want to reset the score to zero and then just go back and drop the ball again, that's fine. You can do that. If you want to be more clever, add another label with a number of lives, let's say three lives. And then if the ball goes past the bat and off the bottom of the screen, lives 
goes down by one. The score stays the same and the game resets again. And then when lives get to zero, maybe it could show a game over label or something like that. So there's a couple of things you could do there. The other thing is you could see if you can get the ball to start on top of the paddle and it only fires when the user kind of clicks a bit like it does in the real game. So when you have a go of those kind of things, we've basically got a game now that does some basic physics. You can see here how we have the schedule to run that physics and you can see that it's kind of quite messy and there's lots of trial and error and sometimes you might put in a, a new bit of code and that might break the way the other code works so there's lots of things to kind of test out there but the nice thing about this is that's really just adding some items that's handling the touches a little bit of um you know real world positioning and then everything else, or the actual game logic, is is in one method. So we still haven't written very much code, and we've already got the basics of a bouncy ball game. So have a little play, see how you get on, see if you can improve it a little bit. And in the next video, we'll kind of add in some of those other nice bits and make it look a bit more like a proper game. And we'll also start adding in blocks and working out how we can hit the blocks to destroy them. Uh, and stuff like that. So as usual, questions and comments, please chuck them below. Otherwise, I will see you in the next video.